okay, so you might be familiar with these two quotes, but in this um, webinar, I'm going to look at how stories change the world. And I hope to um, present a, a good argument for how that happens. So these are the five things I'm going to cover in this webinar, how we make the world, the, the, the drive for stories, the how it affects identity, um, brain chemistry and stories, how stories change things. So those are the five areas I'm going to look at. Right, so let's get started with what makes a world. So when we communicate, it's often a jumble of these three things, stories, beliefs, and facts, uh, not separated, but blended together. But if we think about it, and we look at them all separately, we might feel that uh, when we communicate, we start with the, the facts. So let's just say, let's pretend that I'm a internet millionaire, and my story might be, or, or my, my feeling, my experience of the world might be, to look at the facts, my fact, the fact I may have might be, I'm, I have a million pounds. That's a, that's a kind of a fact that's measurable. And then we assign a meaning to this, which creates a story. So we, we create a meaning if, if uh, the, the story, the outcome of the story might be because I'm great at my job. So that there's, we attach a meaning to this fact and create a story from it. And the whole story might offer more of an argument as proof for this, for this story. The, the story then becomes a belief when we accept it as a truth and no longer needs proof. So this can be then applied to the world. So anyone who's good enough at something will have wealth. For example, that might be a belief that comes from this, this process. So that then creates a myth. But what do we actually mean by the word myth? Because it's not necessarily straightforward. So myth now means is often used to mean a fictional story like a Greek myth or something not to be believed, for example, an urban myth. But interestingly, before the Enlightenment era, uh, myth actually just meant story. To be more specific, in Latin and Greek, it just uh, was used to mean thought, uh, speech, thought, story, anything delivered by word of mouth. And Plato just meant the telling of stories. It was only given this new definition from 18, around, around the 1840s of something that's untrue, specifically untrue, or a rumour, also untrue or unfounded. And the Enlightenment around 17, kind of 15, the Enlightenment promoted the uh, hard scientific facts and denigrated the emotional truths of folktale, which the Industrial Revolution, um, starting with the Enclosures Act, really kind of fueled the depreciation of folk stories and dismantling folk life. And this also helped to alter the meaning of the word myth, to take away its sense of expressing truth or belief. So, for example, uh, a, a folktale might be um, Ireland, Ireland, the country of Ireland, had a, a cauldron, a magic cauldron that brought people back to life. So if you were at war with people of Ireland, it might feel like this. It might, it, this story might have meant these people are indomitable. You kill them, but they keep coming back. So the story describes that argument, they're unkillable, in the same way that we might argue because I'm good at what we do in the previous example. So it's there to express a, a truth or a belief. So now our definition of myth actually looks more like this, which as you can see, this type of story no longer has a place in our process of finding truth in our lives. Although today that is being questioned. So in all of these, these um, definitions, myth really means something to be disbelieved and something to be wary of, something untrue. And just interestingly, the definition of the word story although it comes from historical accounts and finding knowledge, is still associated with something that lacks truth. And yet it is true for us because it feeds our beliefs. We've got to the point here where we, we have created a myth that's believable, but not necessarily true. So we can see how like the Enlightenment era leads us to believe that we should or do start with facts. But do we? Most of the time, what we do is start with a belief. So going back to our original example, let's say our, our internet millionaire example, uh, he might start, well, he or she might start with the idea of if, you, if you're good at what you do and work hard, you'll get rewarded. That's a belief. Then we look at 
uh, we look for facts to support this. So for example, I have a million pounds and I've worked X hours. So there's my fact that supports my belief. These facts then support our story, which is the meaning that we make from that, um, which is I'm wealthy because I'm good at my job. And then this reinforces our belief, which is then used to interpret the world. And you might get some, you might get the extension of this belief stretch, reaching out to um, develop ideas such as homeless people are lazy uh, because they're not, and they're not good at anything. That's why they're homeless. So you can see how this goes round and uh, eventually creates a, a world in somebody's mind. They look for facts to support their belief. They interpret their these facts, and then it feeds um, a, a belief. So thus we have the creation of a world, which is my first point. But I wanted to ask, what is driving, what's driving this? Where is the meaning created in the first place? And it's created in the process of storytelling. So let's just test this. Um, before watching this, what I want you to do, it's, a, it's an experiment by Schimmel and, and Haida. Some of you might have seen it before. But after watching this, I want you to tell me what you saw. So I want you to watch it and I want you to just think to yourself, what am I actually watching? Okay, so I'm just gonna ask now what people actually saw on there. So if you could come off mute and just tell me a couple of things that you, that you saw. So we've got chasing and we've got entrapment. So what's interesting is that what nobody ever sees is just shapes moving around. I mean, yeah, we, we do see shapes moving around, but we've actually interpreted this random shapes moving around. What we've got on screen are just the facts, which is the shapes, but we've all assigned some meaning to them. So we've created a story. We've, we may not be able to complete the story. We may be a bit confused about a lot of it, but we can, we, there's certainly stories being created there in terms of one shape being trapped and another shape being chased and, and things like that. So the other thing is then to think, is the story that you, that, so well, that is the creation of a story, and then it's interesting to think, how does the story that you came up with when you watched it relate to your belief system? So where some person might see entrapment, someone else might see um, chasing, someone else might see breaking free at, at the end. So, you know, that the, 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 the things that go on in the, on the screen, they're just the, the gentle moving around of shapes is interpreted by us into a, a story which matches our, which has a relationship to our belief system. So now we can see how story is a driver for us because when we, when we look at something that's quite um, abstract, we, we weave story into it. So we're quite driven, our brains, our minds are quite driven to find story just in something as simple as this. We can see how story is a driver. So now we need to look at um, this idea. Story is a, a very powerful thing. But your story is a very powerful thing. But the most irritating thing is someone else's story, especially when it clashes with our own story. So we can see this in conflicts between each other, conflicts within relationships when uh, one person's story clashes with, some, with uh, the, someone else's story. And this is magnified in, in uh, world conflicts. So we've seen things going on in Israel and Palestine and Myanmar. But, but why? Why does it matter that someone else is what someone else's story is what, um, and when someone's story conflicts with ours? So our story creates our identity. We 
have a story about what our life experiences mean. And we have to defend our story because in defending our story, we're defending our identity and, and actually our existence. And if others negate that meaning, they're, they're negating our existence sometimes as well. So that's how it feels. When is our identity challenged? So our identity is challenged most when we have to change, when we have to change to meet some change or challenge in, in the environment that's presented to us. That's when our identity is, is most challenged. So change is quite a difficult thing for us to go through because we are actually questioning, we have to question what we, who we actually are when we go through a change. And storytelling is a process of understanding change. So in a story we tell and retell, a character will change somehow, and this is called the character art. And I've got a little mini video here that just shows you how the character art works. You may be familiar with the character art. So the character art looks a little bit like this. We have growth, we have um, growth on this axis and time on that axis. So we start off with a status quo. Now they're not going to change unless there's a reason to. So there needs to be an inciting incident, which we might call the call to action. This is then followed by a number of obstacles and challenges along the journey. And in the midpoint, halfway through the story, there will be a breakthrough where that character realizes has a realization and, and is able to make some change there's still a little bit more growth they need to do there's one final a, a couple of final hurd hurdles and then the final hurdle just before the end where there's something they need to let go of and then they have a new status quo so you can see with this graph that the this is um what we might call a transformational cycle Okay, so this letting go bit here is the is what we also might call the all is lost moment, um, just before the end of a, of, a, of a film. So storytelling is about the process of a character understanding who they are and their challenge is in who they need to become. Commercial films, for example, which are essentially really popular stories, are almost always about self-identity of the protagonist, starting with an in inauthentic existence where something's missing or something's wrong, and every challenge highlights the question of who they are and who they need to be, who they need to become. So if you have a look at this clip, I don't know if you've seen this film, Rango takes on the role of hero and sheriff, uh, promising to solve the problem of missing water, but he loses faith in himself. And this is his all is lost moment where he meets um, a mentor that gives him the key that he needs to, to complete his, his personal transformation. But I can't go back. Don't know that you've got a choice, son. No man can walk out on his own story. Okay, so this is this this key you can't walk out on your own story because story making capacity gives us the, the a structure to make sense of who we are and that, uh, enables us to create um, self-identity. So we've looked now at uh, my third point there, which is about how story helps us to create uh, identity. So we've looked at how we've got the drive. We've got the drive to, to find stories. This is um, tied to our identity and this ultimately makes our world. So if there aren't any more questions, we're gonna go on and look at chemicals in the brain. And there's a nice pattern here. It, it, the story is very often broken down into three very simple kind of sections, which is the, the problem, the, the journey to, to find the solution, and then the, the solution or the change that happens at the end. So the problem, the hero's pain, problem, pain, or challenge, the stress of relating to this releases cortisol in the brain. Cortisol is designed to fo make our focus our attention on something. So the promise, the, the promise is that the hero's journey their hope for the future, what it is that they're trying to achieve, their aim, the, the, um, the little obstacles and hurdles they get over along the way. So the amygdala sends dopamine to anticipate pleasure and this primes the brain, brain to be ready to hear a solution. The solution at the end, the change that the hero makes, that releases oxytocin. So these kind of um, brain chemicals that the brain produces during the process, during the, the structure of the story, they all link in together to help us to learn from focusing our attention, anticipating the information, and then feeling good when we get it. Has everyone seen this film? 
because if you haven't seen it it's definitely worth watching and if you have seen it I don't need you don't need to watch it again and it is a, a nice way of looking at how how brain chemistry affects how we uh, respond to stories okay so um that's really looking at brain um, chemistry how the stories actually change our brain chemistry actually change the way we feel about things uh, and and changes our behavior so we're going to look at more about change and learning so how stories help us learn about change um, and the process of learning so the change cycle explores how the, the, this this change cycle here that I'm going to show you explores how we how the process of change works and how characters and stories go through that process and this is essentially the like the, the five act structure of how um, story of, of movies and um, uh, story scripts. So this is John York's roadmap of change. At the beginning, Act One, if you like, we have no knowledge of, of what's wrong. But then we start to get a growing awareness and eventually, eventually uh, an awakening that something might need to change. That takes us into Act Two, which is the, the next step in the change cycle where we start to feel a sense of doubt about whether we can or should change. And then we have to go through a stage of overcoming the reluctance. And finally, an awakening where we start to take action to, to make the change. And that brings us into Act Three. Act three is where we start to experiment with the new knowledge. And then in the middle of it, we have a breakthrough where we discover key knowledge that really makes a difference. That key knowledge we can then start experimenting with. And that brings us into act four, where we start to have a sense of doubt again. We start to think, oh, maybe this isn't gonna work. Maybe, oh, do I really wanna do this? And then there's a growing reluctance and a regression. And that takes us into Act 5, where we have a reawakening. We start to realise and we accept that actually this, this does need to happen. This, this, this is OK. And finally, we have the total mastery. So that's the change cycle that um, John York talks about. And I'm just going to compare it now with the learning, um, a learning journey cycle, which you'll see is, is very similar. So this is the learning journey. Yeah. Okay. We start with no knowledge at the beginning. And then we start to awaken to the possibilities. We might call that Act One. Then we move on to Act Two, where we start to feel a bit of doubt, a bit of reluctance, some resistance to, to the change. We're questioning whether we can do it or not. Can I do this? Do I need to do this? And then we go through a stage of acceptance, and that moves us on to Act Three. In the middle of Act Three, we'll have a breakthrough, but um, before that, we'll have various challenges and obstacles to to go through. And, and challenges and obstacles the other side where we test our knowledge. And that leads us on to act four, where again, we go through setbacks and have a usually a major ordeal before the final breakthrough towards the end of our um, training. And that moves us on to act five, which is the implementation and mastery stage. So act two and act three and act four, if you like, are the sections in which we would have a, a helper, a guide, uh, an assistant on that journey, maybe the trainer, the various emotions that we go through on the learning journey. We start off with a status quo that we're quite happy with, and then we become curious about the possibility for growth. Then we start to anticipate. We're quite excited about starting. And then at the beginning, we, we start to have a resistance. Some, as it starts, we start to realize the magnitude of what we've taken on. And then there's a discovery phase with experiences and then surprise in the, in the breakthrough stage. And then we start to adapt. We start to adapt what we do and how we do things as we test the new knowledge. And then we go through a stage of reflection and conversation around the, the stage of setbacks and ordeal. And we, we go through a witnessing stage where we start to see the possibilities. And then again, we have a greater, a, a develop, more developed awareness that the learning that we have becomes a gift that we can come back to the world with and we can integrate it into our lives and have a, a sense of mastery over the new learning that we have. So this is the learning journey, the learning cycle. There's various ups and downs along the way and it's very similar to the change cycle. So learning is essentially about change and stories are about change and change is about learning. So stories, learning and change are all um, part and parcel of each other. Right, so I'm going to look at a big story of change now. So uh, this is a story that affects us all. And I'm not sure where we are in the story. We might be in Act 4, we might still be in Act 2. 
Um, and we may all have a different take on where we are in this story, but I hope uh, we can agree that the story is not yet complete. So I'm going to look at this here. So Claire, this is Claire, Claire's life, um, The Flame of New Orleans. I don't know if you've uh, seen this film, but she, her life is basically about getting a wealthy husband. All her skills and intellect to focus on this task. Um, she has to trick people, feign helplessness, and basically faint when she can't find anything else. Um, can't think of anything else. I'm going to show you a clip from just before her wedding, and <laughs> there's some really classic lines in here. And this is Clarissa, who lives here in New Orleans. She will be your constant companion and will teach you the most exciting needlepoint you can imagine. Auntie, the bride must hurry. She's kept the family waiting long enough. Girls, leave this room immediately. Oh, my girls, go on, go on. You are about to be married. Since you have no family here, I take it on myself to advise you in a matter more fittingly discussed with one's mother. However, <clears throat> concerning men, <laughs> unfortunately, there is a side to man's nature has always been a woman's burden. <laughs> Try not to laugh. I must speak frankly. So Claire's really trying not to laugh there. But um, anyway, this is the point really that, um, so this is back in the golden age of cinema where women are essentially eye candy and um, lack agency and generally don't drive anything. Um, and it wasn't really seen as a problem by many until 1975 when Laura Mulvey told us the story behind the images that we saw on the screen and asked us to question, whose story is it? So this is a, a story, this started a conversation that would change everything. Her essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, asked us to think about whose viewpoint are we seeing the world from? Um, because this perspective changes the story that's told and the power of the story, the power of a story is in the person telling it because through their eyes, we see, we see the world the way they see it. So she challenged people to see, to, she was challenging people specifically to see the story of women um, uh, show us the, the world in an entirely different perspective. So now we have, Characters like this in films. I volunteer as tribute. I believe we have a volunteer. You need to get out of here. You need to get out of here. No. Go find mom. No. Go find mom. I know. No. So sorry. No. Hey, mom. No. 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 District 12's very first volunteer. Okay, so now we've got a completely different um, type of female character on the, on the screen from Laura Mulvey asking that question and, and challenging the way uh, who was telling the stories and how were they telling those stories. So this actually has opened the floodgates for not only women, men, to tell their own story and show the world uh, their story through their eyes, but also now we expect and demand to see films through the eyes of a variety of people, women's stories, people of color, different sexuality, minority groups. And by seeing the, the world through the eyes of all kinds of other people, we get to understand what the world really looks like, not how the ruling groups like to see the world. So Laura Mulvey's story about screen stories started a profound change in the world and it challenged us all to take control of our own stories and tell our own stories. And in doing so, we changed the story of an entire culture. And that is my fifth point there about how story is an agent for, for change. The important, the important point there is about whose story is being told, whose viewpoint are we seeing that story from? So just to summarise, we've looked at 
today here. So story creates our world through by the meaning that we attach to events and facts, which leads to and supports a belief system. Uh, the drive to create story is built into us and we see stories everywhere. Story is the foundation of our identity. The storytelling process is supported by our brain chemistry and, and changes our brain and way of thinking. And story helps us to change, to learn, and to change others, and to change the world that we live in. So this is my contribution here to helping people tell their story. What is a story? And how does a story change the world? Every story has a hero who wants or needs something, or is somehow incomplete. Every story has a conflict, a challenge, or something preventing our hero from growing. Every story has a journey, a process, or an adventure to take our hero from one state to another. And every story shows change. It leads us, helps us, demonstrates to us how change happens, and inspires us to change. And when we change, the world changes. Okay, so that's it. Um, my, my, the real point behind what I was trying to get at in this webinar is that the, 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 stories, the stories that get told are the stories that shape the world. So it really matters who is telling the story because the person in power is the person telling the story. So you can take control of your story by making sure that your story is heard because if your story isn't being heard, someone else's story is being heard and their story may, may conflict with you, it may damage you and it may um, create a life that is pretty difficult for you to live in. So telling your story gives you, uh, gives you power in the world. So that, that was the main point behind this webinar uh, because, because the stories get, that get told are the stories that create the world. So by, by each taking control and telling our story, we can actually influence change in the world, which is, uh, was demonstrated by uh, Laura Mulvey, questioning whose, whose perspective we were watching the stories from. And now we can see how, how just by starting that conversation, the way women are portrayed, the way women see themselves, is, is, has made a big difference. As I say, I'm not sure if we're in Act Two or Act, five, or Act Four. I think we've got a long way to go there. But um, so I just wanted to know if there was any questions or any comments from anyone about the importance of of uh, women taking control and telling their story, because otherwise, someone else, you know, historically, men have told women's stories. Men do still tell women's stories. Yeah. Um, yeah but they're not stories that women would kind of recognize as their own. But also uh, the, the brain chemistry, how it literally does change us chemically. It changes our brain and it therefore changes our behavior. So it's really important on so many levels to tell our story because it has a huge amount of power in the world. We just have to really take control and do it. Yeah, I think it's, there's two points there. Uh, one is the, the kind of language um, when you're translating from a different language. And the other is when you are, when you make a film about uh, someone else, like if you interview someone and edit that, edit that video down, if you, if you interview someone and you're writing up what they say, and there is an editing process. Um, and in that editing process, you realise how much power you have over the story the guest told. And it's only through film editing that I and editing documentary films that I, I fully appreciated the incredible power that the editor has over the story the guests hold. Because you go out and film lots of footage, but the story that you tell about that is completely down to you. In in the power in the in the editing suite, you can you can make somebody look like a hero or you can make them look terrible. Mm. So you know, depending on the footage, but 
you have a huge amount of power. So it's really, really important for people to understand how media works. Because when people watch a documentary, the, the, it's designed to make people believe what um, is in there. So if people, if people don't understand that the editing process, then that they, they buy into what they see in the media. They buy into it very kind of black and white. They don't realize how manipulative it, it actually is. And it, it, it's the same point with um, translating in a different language as well. When people read something in their own language, they don't, you know, they're, they're going to assume. And when you're translating, you've got lots of different options. It could mean this or it could mean that. You can put a different angle on it. So you see how much power you have there when you translate a story and you have to find the right words because it could mean this or it could mean that. You've got a lot of choices there. So I think it's a really good point that the person telling the story has a huge amount of power, either they're, they're translating, they're a video editor, they're a, a film director, they're a blog writer, you know, wh whatever mm. your... your um, skill is whatever the type of storytelling you are whether it's written spoken film whatever content you make that tells a story uh you you are editing a story and you have a lot of power over over that so it's it's really important for people to understand that other people mm -hmm. are manipulating the story even in the way we live our lives and the way people feed our story back to us we are actually editing our story by the way we live our lives, by the words that we choose, by the things we say to people, by the things we say to each other. We're actually editing our lives as we speak. So we can even think about, you know, the power that we have. Every time we open our mouth, we're actually creating our story. So that's another thing to think about in terms of editing. We, we are actually editing our story as we live our lives by the things we choose to do all day every day thank you everyone for coming and thank you lucy for that fascinating presentation it's going to give us lots to think about i think it's really important that yeah and <laughs> very true that the stories that get told shape the world so i think we all need to go out there and encourage other people to tell their stories and do a bit of storytelling ourselves